so let me tell you what I, what I do. For years, well, you know, I, I do radio. Well, I do radio. Mm-hmm. I do theater and radio. But in my radio training, uh, because of the, because of the radio station and a lot of things, I used to do a lot of interviews. I still do a lot. I do interviews, mm-hmm. especially author interviews, because I used to be in charge of the, uh, what's called the arts department. Mm-hmm. Which uh, which did uh, they did, did um, a drama and literature department was in there and the their music was in there, and then we have uh, critics like that, uh, mm-hmm. like, like you know dance critics and mu- movie critics and music critics that was in charge of the whole department all mm-hmm. those people, but what I used to tell people try to explain to people, I said look um, we're all getting older you know and you know, that whole saying that you know if 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 an older person passes then a whole library goes because nobody talk you know because they have all that knowledge and i would try to encourage people maybe just because i I interview people to interview their elders to interview people you know even when i sometimes i try to interview oh no and they don't understand i'm not trying to interview you i'm trying to to forget i'm trying to get get you to to talk about your knowledge it has nothing to do with you (laughs) you know the, the and make it more personal. Let me put it this way: um, when I was uh, uh, in the in the mid seven like seventy three something like that, I took these extension courses from um, a Trent Wells. We are associated with Trent State College in New Jersey, and I was in the Air Force at the time. Anyway, to wear these extension courses, which means basically you would take a co- college course. Even I was in mm-hmm. the Air Force, take a college course. And one of the things I had was creative writing. Mm. Uh, we had some sort of assignment. Uh, we had to do research, whatever it is. And uh, so I did my research, but what I did was I was I was uh, I was I did I had did a little bit of radio before then. I was doing this program uh, called Saturday Soul with JB. Uh-huh. You know that's my radio. When I first that was in seventy two. So no, that was yeah that's seventy two. So yeah, this is about seventy three. And so what I did was I I cassettes were then you know, and I and then for Lad Millers I did certain things, but then I interviewed people, and I put as as far as research. In other words, I had research that I did with books, but then I also researched people, you know? Mm-hmm. And so when the teacher said, well, I don't know if this is acceptable or whatever, have you? I said, wait a second. I said, what is a book? But it's somebody's words written down. That's what it is. So, well, I went to the source here. This person just didn't happen to write a book, but this is their thoughts on the, on the subject. And he looked, it was, his name was William Craycraft. I love this guy. Hey, thought about it. He said, "You're right." <laughs> so he let me submit yeah. it with 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 this few uh, tape things. So anyway, but my point really is that when I ask people, I said, "Well, you know, interview your your, your elders and all the rest of that stuff." Nobody does it, and I don't understand why. Because you know, I'm, I'm what's called an archivist. I used, I've been doing this since like was doing a lot of tape performance since like 1982 somewhere. I mean, officially, and um, so my passion is to get the story or get people's. You know, we get get the panel recorded. I mean, I have a tape someplace with with this African guy named Thomas Sankata. You know, they killed whatever. But the point is, nobody has Thomas. It's hard to get Thomas Sankata stuff. So as you nice to see. So there's a lot of people I know, other archivists that we have stuff that nobody has. You know, mm-hmm. I don't know if you do. Did you ever hear in this during the civil rights period? There's a woman named um, Ella Josephine Baker. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, well, Miss, well, no, Miss Baker, uh, Mrs. Baker, when she passed, you know what I mean. I went to her funeral, you know, and then I interviewed all the people. So I did, this, I did this whole three-hour program on her, you know, interviewing all the people that knew her and whatever it is, mm-hmm. right? So those are the kind of things, you know, and it, you know that because all those people in one spot at one time, those are the kind of things I try to encourage people to do. But more importantly than that, I don't really like. what well, I should say it that way. I'm really not into what we call celebrities. You, you know what I'm saying? I'm into regular people. You know, people. That, some people, some regular people, have extraordinary lives. You have an extraordinary life. Would you? Let me ask you. Would you? Do you consider your, Do you consider that you've had an extraordinary life? That's what I'm asking you. I know I did. You have no idea if you had an extraordinary life. Just so, happened. See, you don't have any perspective of that, right? So you're not going to judge yourself or anything like that. So by my interviewing you, it has nothing to do with you thinking what you are. It has nothing to do with me thinking what, what, what you are, what I think, right? What happens is we're both in a space at one time. You have things that you should say. I have the, say, skill, whatever, you know, mm-hmm. to ask questions and listen to answers. And it might be valuable to somebody. 
How people? How many people know what you've been talking about the last few weeks about? You know about manners. You know how that came about, even about about AKA or anything like that. Mm-hmm. There's so many people that talk about whatever have you, but that's their perspective. You have a different perspective. You see, so that's what I do. I love doing that in any place in the world. I mean, I was in in Africa. I was in this place called Dembaza. I interviewed this old old man. He's on my channel, and I have several sessions with him. Great guy. I bet that oh, was. unbelievable. Anyway, I mean, we call him Brother Ati. Anyway, he single handedly, listen to me, single handedly in South Africa, in the Eastern Cape, desegregated a chain of stores. Nobody knows that story. Nobody knows who he is. But because I have my skills, he was, you know, he talked, you know, well, mm-hmm. not to set up your poor person. I have that story that's not in any book. Believe me, it's not in any book, it's not any place. Who was he known as? But but nobody but it's just brother, we call him brother Archie, but he's just he's a uh, he's a mechanic. But the point is, let me put this with his story. Let me give you this short thing about his story. He was a driver for there's a chain of um thing. Which which chain was it now? I think it was uh, Edgar's. There's a department store called Edgar's all over okay. South Africa. And their corporate headquarters is in Cape Town, which is what's called in the Western Cape. And now we're, we're, he's lives in the Eastern Cape. But at the time, he was in the Eastern Cape. He was a driver, you know, for, you know, for the big wigs down. You know, it, it, it. anyway, this new guy came from, um, from, I think, Holland, you know, from the Netherlands. Came from the Netherlands to, to you know, and he was his driver. He was a big wig. And he was in the, he was going to be the manager of the Eastern Cape for this, for Edgar's shop. I hope it's Edgar's. I'm, yeah, I think it was Edgar's. And so, first thing he said, you know, he don't know nothing. He said, well, tell me about blah, 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 blah. And so, Archie's an honest man, you know. So, he told him what was happening. And so, and the guy wrote up a report, send it to the head office. Because he had like a month, he had to go around, see what's going on. Send it to the head office. And the head office, you know, looked at it and said, we want to talk to you. We want to we want to you. And then he said, okay, no, no, we want to talk to you and, you know, I'm called Brother Ati. They say Brother Ati. And Brother Ati said, ah, well, I, I, I told you, <laughs> you know, he, he's a white guy. He's, this is like, in, this is like in the, you know, the 60s or whatever it is, this is you know, 50, whatever it was, 50s. And, you know, you know, it's in South Africa. You know, you have to, the, the, the whole, this segregation, all that stuff. No, most worse than segregation, apartheid. And so he didn't want to go, but he went, you know what I mean? Oh, he did. I'm going to tell you the whole interview, but, but he, he, it's on my channel. It's very interesting. But what, but, but they, they realized something. So what he was saying is that when the miners and people like that get off work, say they were going to a place called, say, um, uh, uh, um, King Williamstown or uh, what was it? Uh, Queenstown. Mm-hmm. Queen, uh, say Queenstown, right? And the people, the, 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 the shops were mainly, mainly run by what's called the colored people and white white people and colored people. Okay. Black people did not work in those stores. And they would even be, you know, be condescending to black workers who came into the store because, you know, they come from coal mine, whatever it is, they would, you know, dress, mm-hmm. dress, and they wouldn't want us, you know, they give them, you know how, you know how white people get. So, uh, so he told me, so what, one time he said, so he walks in this, the, the white guy was there, but he walked in before him to the store. The guy comes and afterwards, but here's the, the the lady, you know, where it was very rude to the black guy. Right? The guy heard all that stuff, didn't say anything. Then, and he saw, so, so he saw for himself what was going on. And so he got a directive from the head office, right? Oh, no, you got to, we, we want some black workers in here, you know, basically African workers in there. Da, 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 da. So what he did. He went, you know, to his pl- to townships and stuff like that, or to places. He said, mm-hmm. and he said, and, and they needed female, something like that. And he said, look, you want to get this opportunity? Blah, 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 blah. Gave rid of the, the thing. Don't mess it up. Blah, blah. You know how it's like, yeah. blah, blah. Right. and they started like that. And that's how they desegregated this acres. Now, nobody knows that story. It's not written in any academic paper because you know how academics are. They look at newspapers and stuff like that. They, you know, they they, they yeah, somebody else wrote. You know, they don't go and talk. To, <laughs> sometimes they do these surveys, not with these surveys, whatever they call them, question, whatever they call them. You know what I mean? And really, they take five minutes. They talk to somebody and they go, you know, these no, no, no. This was real. You see, 
So I'm saying that since we have this kind of technology, everybody should be talking to their, you know, to their elders, mm-hmm. even, to, even to their friends. Just get the story down. You don't have to do anything with it. This is not for, this is not for money or a sale. It's for the history of your circumstance. You know? That's so that, a good way to put it. Your circumstances. Like that. So that, that, that's what I do. So when I when I talk to you, which I'm very appreciative that you you talk so much, it's not this nothing no earth shattering things or anything like that. That's what it is, you know. That, so, um, I told you that I had some children whose father was from Africa. Well mm-hmm. the children too. Mm-hmm. And he had a job at Norfolk State as an instructor. In what country was he from? You know? From on um, what part of Africa? Because mm. you know, there's like 55 countries. So. Yeah, no, I'm trying to <laughs> think. Um, it's probably in that area, it's either Ghana, Nigeria. Well, probably it was an English speaking country, I, I, uh, I suppose. Partly, yeah. because those children were taught English, mm-hmm. French. Oh. And. Okay. Latin. Okay, French. That could have been the school that they had, they were teaching only one language, mm. another language. Could have been Cameroon. There was somebody who they call grandfather. He was just an older yes that's gentleman in the, yeah. in the community, and he had the title of the children. People calling him the grandfather. Mm-hmm. So the grandfather went to a meeting at the school and told them his children, and he meant that whether they were old adults or really two age, mm-hmm. age children mm-hmm. are not getting the education he thinks they should get. It's limited what they're getting. They are only teaching them some English, but you don't know where they're going when they leave everywhere this area was. Mm-hmm. They need to go in case they go to France or to speak French. Mm. If they go to a mass and they're speaking Latin, they should have some understanding of what they're listening to mm. other than depending on someone to tell them what they were just listening to. Yeah, they don't teach Latin anymore. My grandfather anymore. had a meeting with the the head counselor and the head teachers and everybody else. What, in and Africa, the priests. Where was this, in Africa? Or in, in Africa. Okay. Uh, Jemima, one of the students, one of the children, uh, said... It was not long for when they have language classes Mm -hmm. that they would walk in the classroom and if this is the day they're going to say something like they were in the say the French area French Mm -hmm. tongue Mm -hmm. they had planned that whenever there was a word they were going to learn in any one language they would learn that word in the other two languages. That this is very have. interesting. This is very interesting. So they were really getting three languages mm-hmm. at the same time, as mm-hmm. well as the native tongue for where they live. It's interesting because you say that because uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm very, my, I don't have a acumen for language. I've traveled the world without, I only speak English, I shouldn't say that. But I spent some time in, uh, uh, in, in Belize, in a place called Livingston, Guatemala. Well, Belize, and then across from Belize, there's a place called Livingston, Guatemala. And in Guatemala, they speak Spanish. You see? Mm-hmm. Uh, but the uh, a lot of the people in uh, Livingston also speak English, because right across from, from Livingston is a is Belize who are English-speaking. Okay. So, what, so I would do, because like, I don't have it, but what I would do, and, and I would actually learn, their, their native tongue is called uh, Garifuna. I said Griffin. It's, it's, a, it's a Griffin of people that speak Garifuna. I don't know how to say Garifuna or Griffin. Anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a language that's a, that's a, that's in um, uh, Belize, on down the coast, parts of um, uh, Guatemala, down through uh, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, Honduras, mm-hmm. um, down through um, uh, what's down there, uh, Costa Rica. Uh, Panama, all the way down, they're fisher people, they're fishermen usually, so down there. So when I was, uh, so because I was trying to learn, not trying to, people were trying to teach me Spanish, but I found it easier to learn the 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 
the Garifuna people's language, the Garifuna, the, that language, and Spanish at the same time. Mm. And it was easier for me to do it that way than to try to learn one language. You okay. see? Okay. You know, so I mean, to this day, and it, it's you, when you go to another country, at least you learn how to say, you know, you know, uh, uh, hello, thank you, uh, you know, uh, where's the bathroom? <laughs> uh, but one thing you say, good morning. So to this day, I remember in, in Garifuna, you say Benita Panafi. That's how you say good morning. In Garifuna, Benita Panafi. Mm -hmm. Like in Spanish, it would be Buenos Dias. You see? Mm -hmm. and, and good morning, of course. So, I, so I'm just saying, if, but my whole thing is I have to actually be there, living there for me to do. Even though I still don't have a language acumen, you get a little older and it gets difficult. But I mean, I know some words, you know, in Tulsa, of course, because I live in a closer area. So I know some, you know, I can, you know, to maneuver see. around but they speak a lot of English there too and what I found too when I was traveling if I try to speak the language they would spend more time trying to learn English <laughs> than trying to teach me you trying it it's amazing but your mama said to us somebody said your mama how is it you know you ask for certain words or places or things and she said because when we I was on at home, mm -hmm. coming to Africa, Grandpapa or Grandmama would always help us if they were introducing a new word or a, a thing for us to do or say. Mm -hmm. They would not give us both the language that we were comfortable with was English, mm -hmm. and also the tongue, the native tongue. Yes, there. Yeah. And she said, not only that, it would give them pictures, mm -hmm. everything that could be related to this new term that they were going to learn. And the whole class had to make a copy of their language book. Mm -hmm. And the language book would have on one side, uh, like a spiral notebook, mm -hmm. they would have the native tongue mm -hmm. on one side and right on the other side, it was that if the native tongue was number four, mm -hmm. number four would be on this side in the new tongue mm -hmm. that they're learning. Everybody had to take the assumption that they did not know. Mm -hmm. They had to relearn or learn for the first time. <clears throat> so one little kid in my class, you always have one child who's mm -hmm. going to be the brain. I asked that question. <laughs> He said, Mother Bagby. I said, yes, baby. Would it be too much work on you if you would let us try that approach? Mm. It sounds like it could work. Mm. I said, I don't mind. Would you like to give us a chance to buy us a, no a notebook with the two sides to it? Because Jemima just said, it's on one side, it's one thing, and the other side. I said, well, since you're going to get a book, I'm going to buy me one, too. You don't have a book? I said, not like what your mama is saying. And your mama said, if what I said was not the right thing, can you forgive me? And the kids in the class said, you asking us to forgive you? And they said, what would your grandpapa say? He would say, my child, the minute you open your mouth to say you were sorry, you were forgiven and sorry at that moment has been accepted. He said, your grandpapa would have to say all of that. He said, that wasn't much. So you listen to my grandpapa. And you know you're in there for the rest of the evening or something, she would say. <laughs> well, that's the way, that's where grandpapas are. But let me tell you something about this this technique that you just kind of interesting. You say that because, again, that's a, a thing. We have, everybody wants to be in charge, be authoritarian. Now, you're describing something where a child gave an idea. You, I don't want to say negotiate, but you engage with the child. And then you, you all both came up with a solution. The mm -hmm. child gave, you see what I'm saying? Now, in this day and age, they don't do that. They have to indoctrinate, indoctrinate, indoctrinate. I have this. I had this initiative in South Africa where I did, where we had a, a do audio drama. But one of the results, one of the things we did in the audio drama, we, we had we had a thing, we had audio drama, um, but then we turned the audio dramas into comic books. 
Now, what was interesting, now, uh, Africa, or something, sorry, South Africa has a, has officially 11 different languages. 11. Yeah, uh, uh, autochthonous languages. I guess mm-hmm. you always say indigenous, but I say autochthonous, I like that word better. Uh, you know, local languages all over the thing. But the main language is, is uh, English, uh, Afrikaans, and then depending where you are, like I'm in a closer area, but there might be Zulu over there or Vendel, or, you know, to mm-hmm. other, uh, Sutu, you know, something like that. But what I did, when we did this comic book, right, what we did with the comic book is say, on, like, say this is the comic book here, right? Okay. And on on one page, you have the, the comic with all the bubbles, you know, the people mm-hmm. talking about what have you, and say, say, the, say, say English, right? Okay. Like that. On the other side of the page, you would have uh, on lines translated as many things as you want what the bubble was saying, you know, the comic bubble was uh-huh. saying. So on this side, you might have, say, a uh, 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 Venda, you might have a uh, Sutu, you know, uh, you might, you know, have, have Afrikaans. Depending. Mm-hmm. So, so, so if you want to, this is my idea. We, ne- we never could do it because I have no influence in their education system or anything like that. You know, they don't listen to little people. <laughs> they, they only listen to people who can give them money. They, 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 yeah, you were a little person. You know, but, you know, <clears throat> because I've been teaching, literally I've been in, teaching on a certain level since I was nine years old. You know, my sister, every time I came home, I'm talking about I was kids, I would teach them everything I knew. <laughs> everything. I taught them how to play chess. No, my you became the melting pot. Oh, man. No, it's just the melting pot. I, I think it's just my call, not my calling. Anyway, what I'm trying to say, there are ways to teach or whatever have you, but they don't listen to, they don't want to engage with either people on the ground or even the child who might have an idea. Certainly uh-huh. nobody's going to talk to somebody. They go, what's your credentials? You know, oh, they want to know what's your credentials, and if I if I say my credentials, I, I'm I'm a child of the universe, I'm a child of this, of this planet, and I've been around and I know what's going on. That's not that's not good enough. No, it's not. Oh no, you got to have a credential. One of one of their one of their institutions that they have controlled that they have indoctrinated those people, and that indoctrination goes to the next generation, next generation, that that kind of thing. So in that sort of case, I'm I'm a definitely I'm an outside out. I'm this thing called an outlier. Okay, mm-hmm. somebody that's real. You have you have your status quo, then you have your outliers. Well, I'm like an outliers outlier. <laughs> so even with, even the outliers, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I would say what would they? we? <laughs> I was doing this play one time, right? And um, the producer didn't know who I was, but the guy that that wrote the play wanted me to direct. It was it was uncompromised. You want me to, so we had this first meeting. <laughs> the producer tells David, he says, he said, look, I said, David, never let Anthony go into a room by himself. You always have to be with him. <laughs> because I'm liable to say anything. I'm cut to the thing. I cut people off. I said, that don't make no sense. I'm rude. I'm rude when I know something. I'm very rude. Mm-hmm. Because of, I shouldn't say I'm rude like that. If people are speaking nonsense, I don't see a reason why I have to compromise with nonsense. You, you know, if somebody if somebody's trying to convince me, then one and one is three. Why should I stand for five hours trying to convince this person that one and one is two? I said, okay, that person's hopeless. I just, you know, uh, I leave him alone. Anyway, so I just wanted to get all that out. You know, so that's why that's why I do what I do. Wherever I am, I try to interview everybody. Interestingly enough, some of my friends don't want to be interviewed for some reason or another. That they have valuable information. They have told, you know, I mean, I don't know what the deal is. I, I have no idea. So a lot of times I actually not interview myself, but I talk into the thing. It's like a living memoir. <laughs> it, it is what, That's what I do. Let's yeah. see the, the song mm-hmm. Barbara Streisand sings, Memories. Memories. I, you know, as I get older. Mm-hmm. I, and I have, and I do some recalling. I think about that song, mm. memories, like the corners of your mind. The corner is dif- different for each person, mm. but if you can bring these memories into the now, mm-hmm. you'll have a whole lot, and there's a whole lot of comparison, but be the same. Mm. If if you think about it. When you're talking about food, have you ever had palm soup? 
No, do you talking about like palm from the real palm, like like, like the palm, I, I, look, look at palm like for church, <laughs> like, <laughs> like like a palm, palm like Sunday. palm tree, like the like palm wine or palm tree. Okay, I don't have palm soup. No, I've never had it. Mm. We had a unit mm. for my ninth graders, mm. the grade that nobody wanted to teach mm. those children. Mm. I don't know why they did not. They real they should have realized that. And the ninth grade is just like the fourth graders in the primary school. It's transition grade. Mm. They are not the ninth graders are too getting too mature to be the junior high completely or mm. high. Mm. They're too mature to be with the lower children, the mm. primary. Mm. So they're like in a transition from one level of development and learning to another level. And generally these are boys, typically. Mm. So when I had my little ninth grade boys, the teachers and them, we were going to have a faculty meeting and somebody said, Doe, I understand that you have a class of 22, I don't know what expression, they, she didn't say boys. Or children, they say, you got that not that ninth grade group of of they called them, gave them some name that was not comp for as I was concerned, it was not complimentary. They didn't say knuckleheads, did they? <laughs> Sometimes they say knuckleheads when they can't do it. Yeah, then, <laughs> but I told them, I said, put a period, you know, put a comma in your statement. I said, don't ever talk about my babies with that tone. They said, this must be a new day. I've never heard anybody say anything about ninth graders. I talked with Fran when we were going home. I said, Fran, that expression that was used in our staff meeting, they said they never heard anything like that. I said, you have, haven't you? You have some of those boys that and girls. See, I had girls in the class, too. I had 25 kids. Mm -hmm. And I had three girls. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the boy, the boys was in the general conversation with people. So what kind of class were you saying? It was like a, a class that they, they isolated these folks? or they have discipline problems? No, it, why, just, why it was scheduled. Mm -hmm. I think it was scheduled and then it was rescheduled. Mm -hmm. So those, some teachers didn't want to have didn't really want to work with ninth graders. Mm. And the ninth grade boys especially, they mm. didn't want to. Mm. And I told them that was my favorite, one of my favorite bells. Mm. It's, I just don't understand. Mm. So they justified that statement by saying, so maybe they are your favorites because they're just like your <laughs> elementary children. Mm. I said, in a way, they just happen to be big first graders. <laughs> And my first graders are probably miniatures, ninth graders. Mm. And you love those boys, don't you? I said, I have three girls in there, too. Mm. I love all my babies. That's another thing. You call them that little sweet name. I know they're not like that. I said, don't talk about my babies like that. That's, that's the point. If they get labeled, if they get boxed, but then, then everybody takes that label and applies it to them. And then what are they to do but to listen, and these are older people, listen to the older people's labels. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, uh, some sort of weird loop. And then they'll say, oh, these people have a discipline problem. Well, no, there's a discipline problem be, because you, if you call them criminals, then eventually, you know, if you keep on calling somebody a criminal, they'll say, well, what is a criminal? Well, maybe I am that. Oh my! This maybe person, I go this, find out how you can do it. I want to be one of those too. Or, 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 or if this is the person that's supposed to love me, or, or you know, look out for me, and they're calling me names. But you know, it's just the whole psychological thing that this society does on you. So I mean, you know, you you can't talk to me about these kind. Of, I'm really radical about these kind, of, especially in education. I have a radical, radical thought about education for this day, this day right now. And I usually, when I'm, when I deal, because I'm trained like a stage manager, I look at what's going, what what I have to work with. Mm -hmm. So like if I was in the education system today, and I know that, that what they're teaching, they're indoctrinating people and the kids don't want that. They don't want to be indoctrinated. They have too much other information out there. So when you tell them this is happening, and they can say, but wait a second, I found it over here that that's happening. 
then then it challenges you. You as a teacher say, no, you can't challenge. You know, you get an attitude, uh-huh. you know. But my, here's, let me give you a radical, that what I consider radical, well, I don't consider it radical. I think it's quite natural with the stuff we have to work with. We know that with the school, a lot of schools are failing because of a number of reasons, you know. Um, and I say, well, not everybody needs to, when I say, let me let me leave the school, the school system out. Let me go to like college. You know, mm-hmm. everybody wants to go to college. Well, not everybody's qualified to go to college. Everybody should go to college. It's not for academia. You know what I mean? They might go for trade or something like that. But so some people, could, but most people, they don't want to deal with this system at all. Been too long. That's how they drop out. Oh, whatever. Right. Well, we have a thing now. We have the internet. Okay, great. Um, which means you can get a lot of different information, you know. Uh, but you also have a thing. Now, how do you deliver that thing? And what's the cost? Well, there's a thing. Everybody knows a thing called Wi-Fi. That's radio waves letting this stuff go through. Well, there's also a thing called Li-Fi, L-I-F-I, like Wi-Fi is mm-hmm. uh, W-I-F-I. Li-Fi is L-I-F-I, meaning instead of using a radio wave to transmit the information, the data, they use light. Mm. First of all, it's quicker, it's faster, and it doesn't cost as much after you set up the infrastructure, of course. So if I tell some, and then plus you have all these smartphones and stuff like that. So if I tell somebody, if I tell the education system, okay, why don't we, uh, let me deal with Africa. So there's this thing called SADC, the whole Southern African region from, from basically Madagascar over through the Congo, all those countries in there, you know, um, uh, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, um, uh, uh, like I said, Lesotho, South Africa, uh, Swazi, uh, well, they call it Isitini now, um, uh, 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 Botswana, all these, uh, Namibia, uh, 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 DRC, you know, all, all these they're in this called the SADC nations, mm-hmm. right? It's about 12 of them or so. Well, you can say, okay, instead, if you if you equip the whole region with Li-Fi, and everybody has smart, so-called smartphones, so if you're a goat herder and say, look, who's the Sutu? Do they herd goats up there, right? Um, well, if you have a problem, you can uh, contact somebody in the mountains of Peru, who also has goats, and say, hey, I had this problem. How, could, how do you solve this? Oh, you solve it like that. So now you have Peru talking to, to Lesotho, solving a problem, rather mm-hmm. than going to some sort of authority, somebody, some veterinarian who wrote this book, get the D, the D, the D. Well, this is the guy that's, <laughs> you see? You want an answer. Yeah. So my, the point is, there are other ways to educate. Now, that thing I just mentioned to you, Li-Fi, the whole cell phone, you know, and thinking that the whole universe is, is really a university. You don't really have to go to spend all those fees and get this book. Well, if I put that out there, that doesn't, nobody's going to embrace that. This guy's wacko. This is crazy. But, uh, yeah, it sounds all like it'll work. But, yeah, <laughs> who's going to th- authorize that? Who does this? You see? So, that's what that, to me, that's what it's about. It's, it's who... Who has the power and authority to get something done? But more importantly, um, what what regular human beings are going to get done? And then ignore. I was going to say, yeah, ignore the powers that be, the the the, the so called, the way that they've been doing it. Because obviously, the way they've been doing it has not worked. That's right. It's not and working. You got to be willing to take an extra step forward and forget about the step behind, because the mm-hmm. step behind was. Probably keeping the instructors mm. at a standstill because they then become comfortable mm. in that approach. That's and that right. that's the only way. But when you have students in your class whose participation, average res- I mean, results of their grades and everything is dependent upon their activities out of school mm. makes a big difference. Those kids in Fran Lumpkin's class, some of them were rep, uh, judo in the mm. judo classes mm. after school. And in order for them to participate in the championship bouts, they had to get a copy of their grades a statement from each, not just one teacher, from every teacher that child would have. And if there was one of those teachers that that child 
was not up to date with his assignments, classwork, or homework. That child would not be able to participate in the match. And generally, if that was happening, the teacher or the coach would say, please look at the board that I'm placing up here now. If you see your name up is up there, congratulations. You will be participating in the in the bat match. But when the kids, some children didn't see their names up there, and they asked the coach about it. He said, it appears to me that in one of your bells, you are behind in homework, classwork, and research work. He said, that's everything, he said. The names that are up here who are participating wasn't too much for them. You mean... I made a mistake in letting you become one of the students. No, sir. He said, we have one week to get caught up. Mm. That's my point. That's what I call indoctrination. I don't think that that really works. Because, again, not everybody is academic. That's Just like right. not everybody is going to be a great judo person. That's right. In my way, if you de- and then it becomes a, a, a what's called a reward system for something that they want you to do. That might not be, a, you know, and their, their reward is, 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 of course, you can take this athletic thing. Mm-hmm. But again, if you had live fire, you know, you say, okay, we'll organize over here to do this kind of thing. But anyway, it, it doesn't work there. I just wanted to, to, to bring that out. Anyway, I want to go on to something else, if you don't mind. I'm going to go this 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 um this book here. Let's stop here. <laughs> 